Okay, until the until this arrest, uh, CYPAC, cybersecurity, but cybersecurity touches us all about everything. And uh, Attila is going to tell us today about the, the need for planning, um, the quality of our planning in our community, our world, locally and beyond, uh, and how we should be concerned about it. Welcome to the show, Attila. Thanks for having me on, Jay. Appreciate it. Uh, I think we're here to talk about the FAA, right? The uh... Well, the let's talk about week. the FAA. That's uh, that's what makes us think about planning. So let's let's review what happened with the F. What happened with the FAA? Yeah, that's a good question. So we we're on the phone uh, last week with Homeland Security, and uh, we do a group call. And uh, he started off the call by saying, "Okay, let's let's talk about the elephant in the room. Uh, let's be clear: there is no evidence of cyber attack or malicious actors or any of that stuff." with regards to the national outage with the FAA. And uh, the so, so that's good. So that, that is good news for all of us. It means that uh, their systems and their firewalls and everything that they've done to protect the infrastructure that, that you know, air traffic control depends upon, that's safe. Uh, what's not safe uh, is the ability for us to do something that in the, uh, in the uh, uh, technology world we call a, an oopsie. That's the technical term. And an oopsie uh, means that uh, we fat fingered a keyboard command uh, or or did something by accident that caused the problem. And that problem cascaded into catastrophic events. So it's usually it's, a, it's a, the beginning of the domino in a chain. Uh, in this case with the FAA, uh, what that meant is that there was an update to a database. And databases run the entire world. Uh, there's a reason that Oracle uh, is valued so high. And there's a reason that you can't buy an Oracle product uh, by going down to your local Best Buy. It's because Oracle runs the infrastructure that we all depend upon. That means banks, credit card companies, et cetera. And there's a database behind the FAA that keeps track of where the planes are, right? <laughs> and if that database is off or corrupted or damaged in some way, Air traffic control can't see where the planes are. Therefore, it's not safe to put planes up in the sky, right? I think that's a that's a fair fair way to describe this problem. And uh, during the course of an update, which is something that occurs all the time, it's security updates, it's software updates, uh, and uh, everything that goes behind that. Uh, there was a, an oopsie. Uh, there was a miscommand that corrupted the database. The database went offline, and uh, when that occurred, uh, air traffic control said, look, we can't put planes safely in the sky. They're, we don't want to kill people, so they're grounded. And that was uh, last Wednesday. It lasted most of the day. Uh, they tried to go back to previous database backups, and sure enough, that corruption uh, was in the backups as well. So they had to do some manual stuff that they haven't really talked about yet to get things back up and running. Uh, but uh, that oopsie is is something we, we've – it's not the first time, especially when it comes to uh, – uh, transportation. Uh, there was a an oopsie uh, with uh, the bus a couple of years back. There was a you know hard drive that failed on one of their servers. They had to take the server offline, and during that time, we had no bus service. Oopsie. Yeah, come well, Yeah, how do you spell oopsie anyway? O o o p s i e. Oopsie. Oopsie. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's something you know um, that you know we all experience. In fact, I have a personal story to share about that. So. Some years back, um, we were running a, a custom uh, application. It was, it was a, a switching platform, so it essentially controlled the telephone system network. And this is back in my work uh, in California. Uh, so this was, you know, twenty plus years ago, and uh, we had a database, and, and uh, it it didn't because of the way that the software was engineered, it didn't support replication, multi-site replication, the way that most of these databases do these days. So we depended on hourly snapshot backups. And at some point, uh, there was uh, an update to the database. Database was marked suspect, and we had to rebuild everything and based on backups and snapshots and everything else. Long story short, it's now 4.30 in the morning. We've gotten everything up and running. I'm so happy, very pleased. We had minimal outage. It was only a few hours, and it was in the middle of the night, but it was 4.30 in the morning, so I was a little tired. And so I said, okay, we're done. We're out of here. And I start walking out from behind the server rack, and I trip over the power cable and yank the cable out of the battery backup for the database server. Turn back on the database server. Sure enough, the database is marked suspect again. Spend the next six hours getting it back up and running. So 
I pulled an oopsie myself. I, I, I understand it, the, how it feels. It, it's not fun. Uh, luckily this was a long time ago and, uh, it wasn't a national footprint. It was just regional outage, but, uh, yeah, oopsies happen. They, they happen all the time, Jay. So, uh, that sure taught me over 20 years ago, how to do business continuity planning, disaster recovery planning, and how to have a, a, a proper plan to keep an organization up and running when there is an oopsie. Okay. Some thoughts and reactions to that. It reminds me of, um, uh, David Ige's first uh, uh, month in office eight years ago, uh, where somebody pushed the wrong button, had it wrong, oopsie, and warned the state that there were incoming missiles from North Korea. I don't know if you remember that, but uh, that was that was embarrassing. I think uh, we all remember that one. <laughs> <laughs> what, it, what it points out is, uh, of course, that oopsies can happen. But it also points out that, you know, back in, say, the early 90s, your computer was a self-contained machine. It didn't connect with anything. Um, soon enough, your computer connected with uh, uh, local area networks. That was something that was nice. And then around 1995, Bill Gates decided he was he was going to make an internet out of Microsoft. <clears throat> and then the world took off from there, where we all got connected and we were part of a global you know network. And and that means interdependence. Uh, dependence, if you will, on much larger structures. So when you talk about the oopsie for the FAA, that's national. In fact, it's more than national, isn't it? Because it has implications worldwide, what happens with the FAA in terms of flight control. Um, so, um, you know, we live in a world of complete interdependence now. Uh, and if oopsies happen, the implications are enormous, just as they are in cybersecurity. The implications are enormous because we are so dependent on them. But furthermore, to go further with your point, um, you know, I think I think the number of um, and the and the range and threat of um, of threats to a given system, uh, whether it be local or global, um, are, are greater. You know, we have climate change in our hands. Um, we have we have ha hacking and cybersecurity issues on our hands. We have so many things that could happen um, to a given system, and the system predictably would include more people, you know, more business effect, more economic effect, um, effect in every corner of our society. And, and therefore, that we have to match that um, interdependence and that risk um, with, with our own ability to plan. And uh, the first thing that comes to mind is, don't we have the systems to plan against an oopsie. Um, wasn't there a system? I mean, we know the answer to this. Wasn't, couldn't there have been a system to avoid David Ige's North Korean missiles? Couldn't there have been a system to avoid, um, you know, the FAA uh, downtime? Um, wh why can't we predict these things? Well, we can. I'll tell you why. It's because we're all human. So we, we become our own worst enemy in these kind of circumstances. Um, and until the day that we decide to hand over all control of our critical infrastructure and our transportation systems over to some sort of AI and then wipe our hands clean, uh, which I, I believe there's a series of movies about how that goes bad. Um, we, we don't want to, we don't want to do that We're, we are, we become our own worst enemy, but that also means that we are our own salvation. So by having, uh, realistic expectations about what we can do as human beings to to keep our infrastructure alive, we can also plan for our shortcomings, right? Uh, there are there are certain times of day and certain days of the week that you just don't do updates, right? <laughs> like, let's say, for example, you want to do a major system overhaul of a company's network. Do you do that on a Friday afternoon? Not really. That's the worst time to do that, <laughs> right? Everyone's tired. Uh, there's vendors that are, you know, they're off for the weekend. No one wants to come in and help you. So you don't do those kind of things on a Friday afternoon. Everyone who's been in tech knows that. Let me stop so. you there. Um, that's a good decision. That's based on human experience. It's based on our, you know, experience in, in the world. Okay. But you could also relegate that decision to AI. You could say, give me, give me a scan of the week. And tell me, you know, what the activity is on this system in the course of a week. Tell me the risks of doing it 
at one point during the week and the benefits of doing it on another point of the week and tell me the best time and, and make that dynamic. But, you know, it'll change. Whatever is the case, it'll know which is the best time. Why don't we relegate that kind of decision to AI? Well, I'll tell you because, uh, and, and we'll talk about this on our next show about uh, about AI and ChatGPT and how that all works. Even ChatGPT, the best, the best it has, what twenty twenty five percent good advice. Now, here's here's the important part about AI. AI does not give you information. AI is meant to give you advice. There's a big distinction between the two. So if we do run this through an AI algorithm, it's going to say, well, based on our on the information, this is the advice I want to give you. Just know that that advice is only about twenty five percent accurate. So it's not always going to be perfect. Um, however, uh, you know, r- rolling back to our, our, our primary thing here, I, I don't like to give, you know, bad news without giving some good news in terms of how we can solve these things. Proper business continuity planning, incident response planning means that we're going to be better adept at handling bad things when they occur. So what's uh, the distinction be- between continuity planning and um, what is the second term you used? Incident um, response, sure. Response planning, uh, recovery planning, if you will. Sure. So incident response planning is typically a subset of a business continuity plan. And I'll give you an example of an incident response plan. So um, back in 9-11, uh, it could be said that we did a wonderful job uh, in responding to what occurred at the Twin Towers. Uh, right. Fire department, police, they all seem to know what to do. But they had never really planned for a plane actually hitting the building. But they had planned for if there was a bomb, uh, if the building was on fire, right? Other scenarios that were similar. And so they knew, okay, this is what we have to do. This is the priority in which we have to do them. And less lives were lost than would have happened otherwise. And the same could be true with incident response planning in your business. Uh, One common method that this is done, this is across the board. This is not necessarily cyber. Uh, is something called tabletop exercises, where the key decision makers sit around a table and they say, okay, this is our scenario. It's novel. It's new. Uh, We're going to simulate what we're going to do in this situation. Uh, We did some tabletops before COVID. It was pretty funny. We, We had a similar exercise, which said, what if there was a biological outbreak uh, in, and which is, has occurred or a chemical spill in the neighborhood and we're forced to evacuate the building. And for uh, the course of three weeks to a month, you're not allowed to enter your building. All your computers, everything is intact. How do you function as a business, right? And so that's where business continuity planning comes into place. And based on that, when COVID hit, uh, the clients that we had run this similar exercise with, they were well prepared. They said, okay, we know exactly what to do. This is how the people are going to work from home. This is how we're going to socially distance, even though it was completely different type of scenario, but they knew how to respond because of the response pattern. And we're smart enough to figure that out. So in the same way, business continuity, incident, incident response planning is something that it's a thought exercise. It's a thought experiment. And that can save us huge amounts of pain and effort um, ahead of time. And I think if, you know, I, I'm assuming that the FAA subcontractor that was involved in this database problem, I'm assuming that they 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 trusted themselves to be able to do the work proficiently, but maybe they had not done the incident response planning, assuming that they had maybe would make a mistake along the way. So you always have to assume the human element. What happens if someone trips and falls and something, you know, you know something happens? Uh, what happens when there's a, a, a bad actor that comes in and causes malicious intent? And the big one, and this is a really big one that no one plans for, but we've seen it firsthand, is insider threat. Insider threat is huge locally. Sabotage. Here and everywhere. What's that? Sabotage. Sabotage, yes. And it's usually from trusted employees. And stories that I could share just briefly would in, include uh, CPAs running away with um, money from the business. How does the business continue to survive from that? Like they physically leave the country, there's nothing to do. Inside of the threat, uh, break in. So they come back and they they break in and they damage equipment or computers so that the business has trouble uh, moving along that way. Uh, theft of data and sold on the dark web, held for ransom or hostage. These are all real scenarios that occur here on island. And I'm not talking like off, you know, t- 20 years ago. This is all recent events. And uh, 
as as a business owner, what 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 you can't do is you a usually you can't control it, but the only thing you can do is plan for it. And usually you're out the money, you're out the headache, you're out the problem. How do you control the reputation damage? We meet with uh, clients regularly that are concerned about this. They say, look, we we just see the headlines on the news. We don't know what to do. Uh, mm-hmm. We're worried that it could happen to us because it happened to our neighbor or it happened to others in our industry. How do we prevent this from occurring? Okay, let me, let me stop you there. And so the tabletop uh, sounds like a very important part of the, the planning process to identify the risks, the possibilities, the threats. Uh, and then, you know, go from there to figure out what you do to harden yourself against that. Um, but um, I, I think there's there's newspaper articles. There are stories of other companies that have had, you know, remarkable experiences, you know, ridiculous experiences. And that has to be factored in. So you bring your management together, you know, across the tabletop and you say, what are you worried about? That's one question. But the other question is, what are others worried about? What has happened in New York, Chicago, L.A. Uh, that is that will inform us on what the risks are? And those guys at the tabletop, they don't know. Uh, they can only read the paper. And so there should be, and maybe there is, a database of these other events that have taken place. And those events must also be considered at the tabletop, right? I, I wish it were true, uh, Jay. So I can tell you this, when there's an incident, only about 20% of incidents are reported. That's usually to law, law enforcement, FBI, et cetera. Um, that I don't know anyone who we've worked with who has been um, eager to share uh, with the public uh, the, uh, the way that they were breached and the kind of problems that they uh, overcame because of it. With, with is, hacking, aren't they obligated by law? It depends on the industry, and it depends on the extent of the breach, and it depends on uh, what was breached and, uh, and you know, what their social obligation is going to be to this. Uh, I, I can't speak to that because I'm not an attorney. I think maybe you would be better, but in general, uh, most folks want to uh, move on because they have a business to run, they have employees to pay and clients to service, and they need to be back and operational as much as possible. And they want to put in safeguards so that this does not occur again. Uh, so that kind of industry knowledge that you're describing is difficult to come by. However, uh, one thing that we have seen is that folks will go to either a convention or a trade association meeting uh, or some other public event where others in their circle are there and they share amongst themselves their personal experiences. So this could be they go to like, let's say, uh, an energy forum, or uh, we've even seen this with uh, dentists, they get together in dental forums, and they come back from these from these dental trade shows. And they say, Oh, my gosh, I can't believe what happened to this other dentist in my industry or this other energy company or our industry. Um, we don't want this to happen to us. Please help. And okay, well, I have an idea. You know, uh, more and more, uh, when you see these commentators on, on the news channels, the uh, cable especially, you see credits to a company called Grab- Grabian, E-R-A-B-I-E-N. And so when they want to have a couple of people, you know, talking about something in Congress, for example, Grabian will sell them the footage. Um, and I, I think that's very interesting. Um, but you could also have the OMG Library. That stands for, oh my gosh, the OMG Library. <laughs> And a guy like you, Attila, for example, or your staff would go around and you collect all these stories about the dentists and about the what's reported in the print press. You know what has happened um, to you know in in other other uh, other places, other companies that are reported elsewhere. But your your people at the tabletop, they don't know it never happened with them. But so you could be there at the tabletop and you could say, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me show you the kinds of risks that have been reported in the newspaper uh, or elsewhere uh, from my OMG company. Uh, And we should consider that. Uh, And and I know I don't catch them all because not everybody reports, you know, all the violations and and the risks, but this is as complete a database of of risks uh, that that you will find anywhere. And they have got to be considered. Uh, Wouldn't that be a viable approach to bringing in other risks? 
Well, I, I don't know about you, Jay, but the last time that anyone made any choices based on strictly data, uh, that's it's it's pretty few and far between. So sometimes throwing more data at at a uh, at a scenario doesn't necessarily help us. I mean, it can it can help in influencing the decision, but they're not going to ultimately make that decision. Uh, this is why those those kind of in person or seeing other uh, news uh, uh, news that comes out. Uh, regarding a specific incident that's relatable to their industry. So, for example, uh, there was a national company that's a PEO. Uh, they're they're a uh, employer, and uh, they were recently breached. And the attack pattern and how they were able to get inside their customer data and create that kind of problem for them that was very influential in um, you know in other PEOs making adjustments here. Same thing, uh, we, we, there was a recent one about a financial uh, planning, or I'm sorry, an outsourced accounting firm. Uh, they were out of, uh, they're on the mainland, so they're in California. But that outsourced accounting firm, they were breached. And it's a, it, we could see over the course of six months how their reputation was damaged and uh, their clients one by one left them. And at the end of six months, they had to sell all their equipment, uh, their desks and computers as a, at a fire sale because they had no more clients left. That kind of reputation damage and, and seeing that pattern of, of what occurred because they couldn't recover from this. These are all stories that we can bring back to other uh, outsourced accounting firms. And they can then benefit from seeing the the cost of inaction, I guess, is the best way to put it. Well, let's talk about costs for a minute. Um, so, you know, there was one um, company, uh, it was a business company, it was a stock house in uh, the Twin Towers uh, that had done exactly what you said. Um, and so after 9-11, they were able to continue to function. Uh, and it was to their credit, and they enjoyed a, you know, a, a very positive reputation over that because a lot of companies didn't have a shadow computer organization elsewhere, and they failed. They, they were over. Um, and so um, that, they were smart, and they put the money in. So I have two questions about that. One is, you know, where do you draw the line about putting the money in? And creating a, a shadow computer operation it isn't cheap. Um, you know, uh, connecting people with all of the security issues uh, with other computers elsewhere at homes that can operate even when the head office goes down. This is, you know, this is expensive. And furthermore, last part of my question is the technology is changing all the time because of, you know, call it cyber threats, whatever. Um, so you have to update your shadow operation. You have to update your remote access with new hardware, new software. Where's the line? It can get very expensive, Attila. Yeah. So, so Jay, I, I agree with you. If, if we were in, uh, if this was 2002, uh, and it was it was very expensive to use the cloud or create a redundant network such as this. But uh, it, the pandemic has really shown us that people can work remotely. And most things can be done in the cloud. Uh, streaming video, like what we're using right now, uh, is not unusual by any means. It's been around a long time. And uh, it's it's a viable way for teams to work remotely. Uh, during the pandemic in our particular business, it was... I mean, we were already using the cloud. We were already using this stuff. There was there was no disruption at all with what we had to do, uh, and uh, I think a lot of other companies found that out pretty quickly too. That they don't really need desk phones on every desk and then someone sitting in a cubicle every day, uh, and they don't need enormous offices. And just don't take my word for it. See what Salesforce did and Yahoo and a lot of these other really big tech companies on the mainland. They forfeited their office space. They didn't need it anymore. Um, yeah, there is a push to, you know, maybe bring some people back into the office, create hybrid working environments. It's true. That still has has merit. But 100 percent back to the office, um, it's, it's not as necessary as it used to be. And uh, what you describe as a, as a shadow organization, what they did, that, that was very smart of them to create some redundancy within their uh, their their uh, infrastructure. And uh, I encourage everyone to think in that way. Uh, especially if you're going to be doing business with any sort of critical infrastructure, federal, state contracts, et cetera, this is going to not only be preferred, but a requirement. You won't be able to continue uh, participating in these kind of jobs if you don't have redundancy, if you don't have tabletop exercises, you don't have basic security safeguards in place uh, and some basic good habits. 
you know, a lot of these tabletops, when we talk about, you know, how to get through things, we talk about email being breached. Well, how did the email get breached? Well, it's because I used my password that I, that I used for my LinkedIn and that LinkedIn account was compromised and, and during a breach five years ago and I never changed the password. Really, guys, bad cyber hygiene is going to be responsible for your own downfall. Like I said in the beginning, you are your own worst enemy, right? So that also means that you can also be your best friend. You can do something about this with proper cyber hygiene, not just, uh, you know, <laughs> not just in your organization, but individually. So uh, this comes from proper training being able to identify problems. So, right, remember I talked to you about password reuse. That's a that's a boring one. How do you identify uh, insider threat? There's a standard way to do it. It's when well studied. You can uh, f figure out when an employee is headed down that path and catch them early and turn them around before they become a detriment to the business. So well, all let, let, things two things important. come out of that. Um, you know, uh, one is it, it seems to me that uh, instead of having all this uh, virtual connection to a headquarters, <clears throat> why not just dispense with the headquarters and and have the you know and have the company deal on a sort of neural basis, where you know you're connected by vir by virtual all the time for everything, uh, and then you put your effort into making that as safe as possible, as renewable, as as hardened and resilient as possible. But you don't care about having an office in a, an expensive downtown location. Uh, you make this company. Um, completely virtual in the world. I mean, it's going that way anyway, isn't it? Yeah, this is this is uh, this is the this is the new workplace. I mean, I, I remember uh, you know we used to do these shows out of a studio on downtown, and uh, last time I was in downtown, I saw a lot of empty offices, mm -hmm. and uh, so that's an indicator that most companies have figured this out. Uh, if if not, it if not, they're they've really downscaled the amount of physical footprint that they need. And it's only for specific industries, but you know, our, our economy is based on knowledge work. The U S is, we're not big on manufacturing. This is why a lot of this is overseas. Uh, we're, we're knowledge workers and knowledge work can be done remotely in the cloud from home, from remote workspaces. Maybe it works for everyone. Personally, it doesn't work for me. <laughs> I still need an office. I, I need to get away. I like to keep that separation. And that's just my personal preference. But for but many your folks, can be smaller. Yeah, it can be smaller. We don't need that kind of huge footprint like we used to, and and that's okay. You know, it's based on personality type. Just know that the majority of work, though, and even though whether we're here or not, I mean, I can pick up my laptop and work from anywhere. As as can many engineering firms and professional services firms. You don't need that kind of stuff like you used to. So, in terms of um, you know the plan. Uh, the plan for, you know, uh, dealing with the incident, the plan for recovering from the incident. Um, those those plans presumably have changed in the past, you know, say, three years because the phenomena, the dynamic you described that we are talking about uh, has has been quite pronounced over the time of COVID. You know, uh, we, we learned about uh, virtual connection. We we learn how to do this and they learn, you know, Zoom put in, remember this, Zoom put in all kinds of security functionality in their product uh, because there were problems. And now Zoom is a lot safer than it was. I don't know if it's completely safe, but it's a lot safer. And, and so, um, you know, uh, I guess, you know, what I'm saying is uh, um, we're there. We, we're, we've crossed the bridge and the, the plans uh, would be different today. Somebody made a plan uh, back when, say, in 2015. That plan would not be relevant right now. There'd be the company would have changed under them. No. Well, once again, going back to what you mentioned about Zoom, right? Why why was it that there were so many Zoom bombings? Well, it's because folks weren't protecting their meetings with a four digit PIN. Right. So we're back to user behavior. It's not that Zoom by itself was insecure. It was user behavior that did it. Uh, tons of people have made this mass migration at the beginning of COVID to uh, 365 and uh, Google Workspace. Uh, however, 365, uh, which is Microsoft's platform, right? Uh, by default, they have a lot of things open because they want folks to come onto their platform very easily. 
And the consequence of that is that, you know, folks would jump onto this platform, they start using it, not realizing that their data was free and open for anyone to read. So there is, uh, if any of anyone who's watching uh, uses Microsoft 365, well, make sure to check your Microsoft Secure Score. It will tell you what vulnerabilities are inside of your platform and how to remedy them. Most people don't do this, right? So that Secure Score is super important. Uh, Google also has, uh, you know, folks are just sharing files left and right and don't realize that maybe they leave files open for sharing for contractors that no longer need to have access to it. Uh, these these kind of problems exist, and there's tools built inside the platforms to show you, hey, here are the things that you have open. Go ahead and close that up, please. Bad cyber well, hygiene is going to lead to problems. Cyber hygiene has built within it the notion of training your employees, your staff, uh, your management um, on, on how to prevent these things, um, both um, on doing oopsies uh, and on uh, you know telling telling the state that there's m missiles heading their way. I mean, I, I, I suggest that a lot of these things could be avoided by training. Uh, so I, I take your point that if you leave it to the computer alone and you don't have a well-trained workforce pushing the buttons on the computer, um, no software is going to be able to protect you. You are correct. You are correct. So, yeah, it's training, it's mentality, it's it's understanding how things work in terms of uh, how these attack patterns occur with from bad actors. And uh, understanding your own weaknesses, right? As a as an organization, uh, how will you manage uh, if there is a problem with uh, with a fire or a biological outbreak or uh, a bad actor gets inside your network? Uh, what's going to be your PR plan? How are you going to do reputation damage? How long is it going to take you to get back up and running? And the good news is, don't take my word for it. Go ahead and Google or use ChatGPT to look around and ask about templates for business continuity and incident response planning. Tabletop exercises sometimes require an outside consultant if you're if you feel like going that route or you can do it yourself. This isn't magic. Uh, most of the exercises are uh, common scenarios that you can plan for in your organization and it's important to debrief after this. So the most important step is the debrief. So you can do all this business continuity planning, write out a wonderful business continuity plan and then at the end of it, uh, when the, a real incident occurs, if you don't have a printed out copy ready to go in a red binder in the folder in the uh, bookcase behind you, when all your computers are locked up with ransomware, you won't know what to do. Yeah, <laughs> business really. continuity plans need to be done once a year, minimum. So, yeah, once a year. That was the, my next question was, uh, you know, you have to update these plans um, because the world is updating around us more quickly all the time. Um, so therefore, how often do we have to have the tabletop? How often do we have to you know, review the plan or throw the plan out and start with a fresh creative look? Yeah, the, one of the uh, clients we met with recently, they uh, they said, yeah, we have a we have a business continuity incident response plan. I said, great. When was the last time it was uh, updated and reviewed? And they said 1994. There you go. That, that, in a word, that must have been a funny moment there at the, at the tabletop. This is about a year ago, so it wasn't that long ago. <laughs> so, you know, one thing that strikes me also is that, okay, you can have an oopsie, it's a human thing, but the cascading effect is, I'd like to ask you about that, the domino effect, if you will. So somebody makes an oopsie, it sets something in motion. Okay, now we have the, the real problem of that setting something else in motion and on and on, you know, down the line with the domino effect. Um, can't the software prevent against that? Can't we build software to, we may not be able to stop the original oopsie, but we could build software to stop the domino, right? Yeah, it depends on the industry. Now, remember, typically, uh, so let, let's just look at dollar amounts, right? So typically those that handle larger dollar amount transactions are going to be involved with, um, with more critical or sensitive data, right? And that's that doesn't matter what industry you're in, right? So if you run a $1 million company, gross revenue of 1 million, there's a good chance that you're not working with very sensitive data. It could be that maybe you're a florist or um, you know, a HVAC vendor, something like that. Now, not to say that those are, those are not as important industries, I mean, they are, 
but the sensitivity of your business being impacted by a business interrupting event or BIE, uh, you're probably not going to have huge community impact, right? Uh, now imagine if you're an energy company, right? Oil refinery, uh, you know, you're in the transportation sector, right? Uh, the budgets in these kind of sectors are hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, controlling that kind of cascading effect is going to be critical. And in our experience with working with critical infrastructure, uh, when a bad actor is inside the network, they're not going to shut it down. They want to watch. They want to see what happens. And uh, they will typically take safeguards to prevent that organization from coming back online very quickly. Uh, so it's it's particularly important to do those kind of planning exercises and to have appropriate types of uh, detection mechanisms in place that are going to find those kind of um, issues before they become a real problem. Let me give an example. Uh, there's a uh, list of, I think it's I believe the 289 list that has a list of uh, vendors that come from China. And uh, one of them is, for example, Hike Vision. They're a DVR camera system. They're probably one of the largest in the world. And they have been uh, known <laughs> on networks to send traffic back to their country of origin, which is China. And uh, that kind of activity is not permitted uh, for anyone who's working on federal contracts. And uh, anyone who's in the private sector would run uh, would right away recognize that as being a problem, right? They don't want their camera feed and video feed being sent back to the Chinese government for surveillance purposes. Uh, so uh, these kind of things you can detect with the appropriate tools uh, in a critical infrastructure environment well in advance of a threat. So there are special tools that, that are, are used for this. Um, and they're, they're, you know, once again, not tools you're gonna see on the Best Buy shelves. These are critical infrastructure tools that detect these things in advance so you can stop this from happening. Well, there's gotta be a combination of things that you have at the ready you know, to prevent your company from, from failing after an attack or a phenomenon that is likely to bring it down. But one thing we haven't talked about, we last my last question because we got to go soon, um, is insurance. And I can see approaching um, the risk manager of the company. Maybe he's there at the tabletop, and he says, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." But we can go out and place insurance on this. We can cover the risk. Let's not worry about it. Let's just get a policy. Uh, where does that play? That's a great question, Jay. So uh, some legislation came out earlier this year. Uh, that said, uh, essentially, that if the bad actor is tied to nation state in any way, it's considered an act of war, and they are off the hook. They don't need to pay for that insurance policy. Um, there's also some additional caveats in there that we've seen over the past year, where uh, they, in order to renew your cyber policy, there are certain safeguards that need to be in place. Uh, everything from a, we've seen different different lengths of this. We've seen one pagers. We've seen fifteen pagers. Everything from uh, do you have a employee security awareness training program in place? Do you use multi-factor authentication? Do you have a password rotation policy? Um, do you have encryption arrest? How often do you test your backups? Stuff like that. That's a big one, by the way, that trips up people. How often do you test your backups? No, I don't know. We make backups every day, but you got to test them, right? It's not yeah. just that simple. So uh, These are underwriting considerations. They're questions right. relating to the... The, the premium, I suppose. And when you say premium, you're also saying the insurability of the company. And if you can't satisfactorily uh, answer those underwriting questions, you may not be able to get the insurance at all. Or they'll insure you. And if there is an incident, they have a reason to deny your claim. But if they didn't answer it accurately. Yeah, sure. So the whole panoply of insurance issues flow into this. Suffice to say that if there is a risk manager or the company is concerned about you know risk in general the business pro proposition they should look into insurance so to the extent there are products that would cover these these risks wow exciting discussion okay um uh, every discussion we have is exciting attila because um, it, it's all now and it's all going to get worse attila Sares, uh cypac we'll see you again in a few days we're going to talk some more about ai thanks so much Appreciate it, Jay. Stay safe out there. You too. Aloha.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.